Good afternoon. Welcome to Video Art in Context, the course I'm honored to teach with Professor Shannon Jackson. And my name is Greg Niemeyer. I'm a professor in art practice. And I'm looking forward to talking about video art and cinema and um, the difference between these two things. I want to acknowledge that the course is sponsored by uh, Pam, by the Fam Kremlick Foundation, Pam and Pamela and Dick Kremlick, and uh, they've been uh, really generous in supporting this course and many other initiatives around video art education, and we're privileged to be able to offer things uh, in this course that we normally can't afford to offer. So it's a real thrill to be part of that story and part of the idea of making video art more transparent to the broader public. So um, I'd like to also acknowledge Sihan Lu and Sachi Mulki, uh, our grad, uh, grad student instructors, who are going to be instrumental in this lecture because we're going to do a live demo of something that we're going to try out, but we can't do it without Sachi. So we may have to wait until Sachi's actually in the room. I'm going to uh, share a few slides today. There's a lot to look at. I hope there's uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. And um, there's a lot of materials. This time we have no sensitive content warnings, so uh, it'll be an easy lecture in that sense. Um, but indeed, I want to talk about classifying things. <clears throat> My kids, uh, when they were young, they were very proud of learning the shapes they know. They had a t-shirt saying, the shapes I know, circle, square, triangle. And um, as they grew older, they went to the next level of t-shirts. And of course, these were the Dungeons and Dragons dice here. I know my shapes. But today, we're here to talk about I know my video art, which turns out to be a little more complex. Maybe it doesn't fit quite onto a t-shirt, but um, you'll be able to navigate that just like you know the shapes and the Dungeons and Dragon dice. So here's that image on that t-shirt, a little bigger. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> indeed, there's three vectors that I'd like us to consider when we look at an image that is moving. And uh, the first vector would be to distinguish between a rich image and a poor image, and that is in terms of resolution. Like, is it a very clear, crisp image, or is it kind of blurry and rough and maybe copied and compressed multiple times? And on the left and right axis, you have to, this distinction between a poetic uh, approach to image making and the narrative approach to image making. And we'll unpack that more in the lecture as well. And on the sort of the third axis, the z-axis, you have this distinction between documentary uh, intentions and fictional intentions. Uh, documentary intentions about recording something about the world that is normally invisible and uh, making it visible in a clear and realistic fashion as close as possible to the truth. And the fiction, which has a different intention, which is more about talking about maybe a narrative truth or telling a story. The story may be real or not. Of course, it has deep implications for how we navigate reality, how we live our lives. But still, it is fundamentally an imagination rather than a real story. So um, these three axes configure a space, a space of possibilities. And I want to uh, emphasize the distinction between classifying things and say, saying this is this and this is that. That might be helpful as well. But um, I emphasize also the option that um, when we have categories like this, really it's interesting to see how things connect across those categories rather than uh, keeping things separate. So we'll come back to that theme more. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about some basic terms that we established a little bit last time. And um, I just have to show this wonderful clip because one of the texts we're dealing with today is a text by Hito Styrel called In Defense of the Poor Image. The poor image, as in, as in one of the axes we're talking about. And in that essay, um, Hito re refers to um, the image quality um, as uh, portrayed by uh, Woody Allen here in his movie uh, Deconstructing Harry. And, um, it is a wonderful sequence about the blurry image. Let's see if it's uh, maybe two months ago. So um, here we have an actor, uh, Robin Williams, uh, acts as Mel here. And it's a wonderful clip that shows how he has a terrible fate that afflicts him. And um, um, let's play it as it is, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. So here we go, two minutes of comedy. The actor. It's got them lenses, something wrong with it. What, this one too? I changed lenses. What are you talking about? The focus is off. I don't know why there should be such a problem. Well, you check the center, it's out of focus. I've checked all the lenses, they can't all be short. Come on, guys, come on, let's move it along. It's getting late here, we gotta move it. shoot Mel on a bench and he's soft. What? Yeah. Where the hell are you renting these lenses? The lenses are fine. Holy 
this shit. Mel's out of focus. That's what I said, genius. He's out of focus. No, no, I don't mean the lens. I mean Mel himself. What? Let me see that. Get the hell out of here. talking about? I don't believe it. You're right. Mel's out of focus. What? What the hell are you talking about? I said the actor's out of focus. What? How can this be? Is there something wrong? Mel, come here. What? You I don't know how to tell you this, but um, you're soft. I'm getting a little late. No, no, it's, it's not that. You're you're soft. You're you're, what you're out of focus. What is, I don't know why. Is there anything we can do about that? Nothing we can do. I can't adjust. Just look at yourself. Look at yourself. There's nothing. There's nothing to do. It's sort of. You sure? You sure you're okay? I'm fine. It's just it's it's fuzzy. It's kind of. All right. Look. I think you're fine. That was fine. Mel's out of focus. He's soft. I don't know what to do. It's, it's so almost four o'clock already. Anyway, why don't we just wrap? We'll wrap and and we'll see what 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 happens. Mel, now look, I want you to to, to go home. Yeah. And I, and I want you to rest. Get some rest and uh, see if you can just sharpen up. Grace, I'm home. Hi, honey. Hey, what's the matter? You look strange. I'm out of focus. Yeah, yeah, you are. Just, just a little bit. You are, mm -hmm. and, and and you look pale. Daddy, you're all blurry. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe you should go lay Daddy, down. I'll Dad bring you some focus, tea and toast in bed. Daddy, Daddy, Daddy doesn't need focus. that. Okay. Yes, come on, now you be nice. What happened at Daddy work happened today? To you? No, no, no. Daddy, at first they thought it was a camera. Focus. Reuben, stop it. They thought it was a camera, then they thought, then it was, it was me. Really? Yeah, they sent me home. It's so humiliating. Did you eat anything strange at lunch? Any shellfish? No, this is not an allergic reaction. I don't know what it is. You know You know what? I just need to lie down, get a good night's sleep. I'll be okay. You know? I'm sure that's all that's it all. is. I'm that sure it is. You. Well, you know, you get a good night's sleep, turn in early, and I don't... There we go. So... Uh, maybe two months ago, the what, actor... Something wrong here. Let's try that again. Uh, maybe two months. There we go. So that's the camera, right? And it's really funny because this poor actor is just not performing as usual, and he just has physically become blurry. So the point of that clip is to show that the, the, the men looking at the camera first think there's something wrong with the apparatus, the cinematic apparatus. They think the lenses are rented from the long, wrong supply store or something's wrong with technically and they look into the machine, but the machine is fine. It turns out the problem is the, the human, the character is simply out of focus. And, um, of course, that is fictional and entertaining. Uh, and it's really well done because of the special effects at the time. This was 1997. The special effects were really hard to get exactly right, and uh, they did a wonderful job uh, with the tools they had at the time to uh, keep him, um, Robin Williams, blurry. But his bag, for example, when he comes home, is in focus, so he's really carefully uh, built image that was uh, probably involving a lot of manual labor to get that effect just right. But um, uh, so. We see in one clip there both a, a, a poor image and a rich image. The rich image is everything else, and the poor image is poor uh, Robin w Williams being all out of focus. So, uh, wonderful clip. The next, so that's the camera. The next element that needs to be in place in terms of means of production for video is, of course, memory. And for memory, I just have a picture here of a film strip that. Um, it's 35 millimeter film strip, and you can see that memory is material. It has a materiality to it. Even digital memory has a materiality to it. Of course, it's very small, but um, it still has materials. It still has electrons being trapped in little wells. And so whenever we make a movie, we have to capture something with a camera, and we have to store it somewhere. And then, of course, we have to display it. And uh, the display has a materiality as well. And uh, here I want to acknowledge a movie called After Sun. Who's seen After Sun? Uh, 2022 movie by uh, Christine Wells, and uh, it's a fa yeah, it's a really moving movie, right? Very powerful, and it plays a lot with memory, and it plays a because the whole movie actually is about a woman considering her childhood and the, the tragic. Uh, well, I can't say anything uh, to ruin the movie for you, but anyway, she's re reconsidering her childhood, and she's doing that by watching a videotape, which was made on occasion of a vacation she took with her father in Turkey. And uh, so you see various uh, devices of uh, memory and of um, 
display here. And so the VHS player, the camera, the cassettes, they're all devices of memory. And uh, the VHS cassette is the device of memory. And uh, the display here is this bubbly screen that reflects the world around it, as well as uh, showing the image that would be projected on it. So this object here, the display, has a materiality. That materiality, materiality has changed radically throughout the course of uh, recent history uh, from projected cinema film, which we still can do up here in this beautiful theater, to uh, the kinds of displays that are surrounding us um, every day. The fourth component of means of production we talked about a little bit that on Tuesday was circulation. And uh, for that, I just want to share a uh, wonderful picture by Nam June Pike. It's called The Information Superhighway, and it's here installed at the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, in Washington, D.C., and uh, it's a, a collection of TV monitors that goes back to a paper Nam Jun Pike, an early video pioneer, wrote in 1974 in which he claimed that we should build an information superhighway. That was very early on, and so this was the early days of the Internet, and it wasn't called the Internet at the time, and so his idea of the super <coughs> Super, in, uh, super information highway and the idea of the internet converged into what we now know as the internet, but um, this is an early visualization of what it would be like to connect the entire nation with uh, information as much as with real goods. So um, circulation simply talks about how images actually reach us and which are the tools of um, uh, uh, the tools of uh, uh, infrastructure, the tools of production, the tools of um, performance that make it so we get images uh, in front of our eyes into our line of sight. So how does it get from the, the, the structure that makes it into our line of sight? And so these are the four con uh, conditions that we can always look at when we consider an image, <coughs> how it was made, camera, memory, a display, and circulation. And then, <coughs> of course, we also talked about visual regimes, and we talked about how um, power gets delegated and man managed through visuality, and uh, we talked about the perspective regime, central perspective, as a feudal way of managing power or reinforcing power. Then the archive regime as a um, bureaucratic, uh, democratic, uh, nation-state type way of um, managing power. And here's a wonderful set of two portraits by oh, Frederick Douglass, who was fighting for abolition by using these images to recapture the humanity of um, formerly enslaved people in the United States, and uh, so that goes to show that um, when we have a, an image of a person in an archive, that archive may configure a state power that says this person is a citizen, this person is not a citizen, based on what they, who they are and what they look like. And that question of who is a citizen, who is not a citizen, who belongs, who doesn't belong, is still today managed through um, cards, IDs with our faces on it. And uh, so if we have any lack of documentation, there's a way in which uh, uh, we don't manifest as citizens. And uh, of course, we're still there as human beings. And so that's, a, in a way, a tension between the bureaucratic power and the lived experience of people that has not yet been resolved. And then we have the network regime, the regime we're in right now. And for that, I just want to show this image and pause in it for a moment. Is this a possible image? <clears throat> this is not a possible image. Why is it not a possible image? Because it's never night on Earth all at once, right? This, would, this is what Earth would look like if the sun got extinguished. So obviously it's an um, a, uh, amalgamation of multiple pictures, and that's exactly the point of networked imaging, is that we have many different images looking at something or many, other, many different things all at once, and it's mind-boggling how many images we use today to configure this network of identities, this network of transactions, and to, um, to traffic in them. So this is actually where I'd like to do our special exercise. So here's a URL. <coughs> this is tinyurl.com ls25 drop folder. And for this, I need your help, because I want to actually configure an image out of multiple images. And we're actually going to do what is called the bullet time exercise. So we talked about this a little bit on Tuesday, and I would like um, three or so people to come up to the stage uh, who are willing to be photographed for this exercise. And then I'd like 30 or so people to come up to stage who would be willing to take pictures for this exercise. And then the 30 pic people taking pictures should send their images to this uh, website, tinyurl.com, ls25 drop folder. It's just a Google drop folder. <coughs> Put your images in there. And then Saatchi, our amazing GSI, is going to stitch these images together and uh, create a 
bullet time type, type image, a networked image of the scene of people that we have here. So who wants to come up first to be a volunteer to be photographed? Yes, please, one, two, three, great. You're in the red, you're in the green, and you're in the blue. That's great. <coughs> Can I be photographed too, is that okay? Do you mind being in the picture with me? <coughs> one of the themes that Professor Jackson introduced early is this fundamental question of what it means to tell a story with images. And one of the key images is Laocoon, the sculpture of Laocoon and his sons fighting with snakes. And this is my version of Laocoon. I thought that would be great if we bring that one along. There we go. It's a contemporary Laocoon. And uh, I think I got another leg in here. All right, good. So, so far, so good. How does this look with the suit? <laughs> is it okay? All right, so do you want to be part of the Laocoon arrangement? Yes? Okay, so stand around me in some way or in front of me or whatever. And uh, good, so we're going to be right here. Let's, let's stand in a, a, a little closer together. Yeah, like that. So we're going to strike a pose, not just yet. Now we need 30 people to come up with their cell phones and take a picture. So I'd like you all to arrange and just come up, just come up. Don't be shy. And uh, I'd like you to all stand around. So some people in front, some people in behind. Just make a complete circle. And try and lay, l align your cameras um, so they're about um, okay. on the eye level. <coughs> yeah. All right. Come a little closer. We need everybody to stand shoulder by shoulder. <coughs> I hope you're all uh, immunized. <laughs> yeah. What's your name? Laura. Laura. Hi, Laura. Ahano. Ahano. Nice to meet you. Sitlali. Sitlali. Aha, Sitlali, Ahanu, and Laura. Okay, good. Uh, I think we're supposed to make a circle. Yeah, yeah. Now I want you all to take a vertical picture, like uh, we saw in the movie Deconstructing Harry. Not a, uh, sorry, a horizontal picture, not a vertical one. So landscape mode, okay? Good. And now we're going to strike some kind of dramatic pose. You ready? We can also jump up if you want. You want to jump? I think that might be a bit <laughs> difficult. <laughs> huh? Oh, we need a couple more cameras, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So are you all in horizontal mode? I see some cameras that are vertical there. Horizontal mode? Okay. So, um, uh, Sachi, I'd like you to act as the director. And I'd like you to uh, arrange us. And I'd like you to count uh, on the count of three to do something that, uh, that is uh, striking your imagination right now. So what if we do stand back to back, just to make as tight of a center as possible without sort of using the center? Okay. Um, now, um, imagine you are dodging a bullet. Strike that pose. Okay. Good. Fabulous. <laughs> oh, you want to correct a little bit and do it again? Yeah. I'm also not going to smile because I'm dodging a bullet. I'll, I'll try and remember that this is not funny, right? <laughs> Laura, right. Yeah, we're, this is not funny. We're like, this is a self defense type <laughs> image, right? So we'll look serious. <coughs> So now, <laughs> what you need okay. to do, so we disentangle ourselves. Not quite yet. All right. All right. All right. Can everybody get a round of applause for this unique performance? <laughs> All right. <coughs> so now, before this lecture is over, by magic of digital media, uh, Saji is going to configure a video for us that will show the scene um, rotating around and has a loop, actually, right? OK, good. So please upload these pictures. I'm going to leave this uh, URL up for another minute. And then we're going to continue with the actual lecture. So you got it all? If not, you can email Sachi and ask again. OK, so 
Uh, we just took 30 pictures in one second. Um, I wanted you to consider that the network regime of images means that we're producing 54,166,667 images per hour, per hour that we load onto Instagram alone. So every hour, Instagram gets uh, 55 million new images, and that's 24 hours a day. So, and that's a global production. And uh, it's mind-boggling how many images we post and how powerful this idea is that we constantly visualize ourselves and constantly manifest ourselves. And we're just talking about images here, but there's also hashtags and networks of people who respond to stuff. It's an incredibly complex system, an incredibly complex network. Network. I'm absolutely sure that no human being will ever understand the complexity of the network that's being configured. And so we actually need to configure some kind of a machine that has a higher order of consciousness to actually make sense of all the images that we're producing right now. But that's a longer lecture. So 55 million images per hour on Instagram alone. However, a lot of these images are of cats. And uh, you might think that um, cat videos are a recent thing, but actually the original first cat video um, is by Maya Dern. <coughs> and uh, uh, I'm going to play this clip here quickly, and it's really sweet, so. Maya Dern, 1944, and it looks like a cat video, and we've seen millions of these, and this one is actually not a cat video, though. It is actually high-end video art, because Maya Dern was working in isolation during World War II and trying to think about making a movie that would restore uh, a sense of harmony, a sense of peace, and a sense of uh, uh, prosperity, and the only thing she could uh, do effectively was to make a movie about her cats having babies. But the effect is beautiful. It's a calming and emotionally rewarding video to watch. It's also aesthetically rewarding. And of course, um, it's called The Private Life of Cats, of a Cat. And uh, it, so it falls in our, in our dynamic here, uh, in, uh, field of possibilities. It falls into the space of a somewhat poor image because of low resolution, but it's somewhat documentary, but very poetic. And uh, so it falls right into the space of video art. And uh, of course, Maya Dern is known for uh, this uh, amazing movie that she made earlier, 1943, Meshes of the Afternoon, which is full of dance performances and very uh, subtle and surreal uh, uh, effects that are not really quite narrative, somewhat narrative, but definitely it operates like a, uh, an artist's film. So that's Meshes of the Afternoon, and you can see here the 3D effect is a little bit <coughs> behind the, the uh, behind the, it's not in the documentary axis, it's more closer to the, the fiction axis here in the Z, Z space. Um, so um, <coughs> here's another example of, a, of an image that I want to uh, talk about a little bit more, but uh, let me get into a few notes here. So speaking as an artist, I'm always a bit apprehensive about over-classifying works of art, because each work of art has the potential to affect you in its own unique way without the label. 
classification can, end, can get in the way of your read of the work. It can push your experience into very specific places or even shut down uh, your own way of thinking. It can put off, it can puff up work in a way that will leave you disappointed, but it can also devalue work uh, uh, that could have been very valuable to you. On the other hand, some terminology, even if ultimately you need to reject it, can help you articulate the value of your own work or your experience with a work of art. It can help you build respect for the work because you can state its value clearly. We often look at videos. Perhaps we even spend more time looking at screens than we do spending, spending time looking at other human beings. I recently spent time watching a mushroom pop out of the ground. I don't know if you had this experience, there was a lot of rain, but actually you can almost see mushrooms grow because they grow about half a centimeter per hour. And you, you look at them and then five minutes later you look at them again and they're bigger. It's just amazing. So um, it's a bit uncanny too. So here's a video of the process uh, from the movie Fantastic Fungi featuring Paul Stamens and produced by Lynn Lear. And uh, let's see if this will play, there we go. All right, so here's the fungi moment. I generate soil that gives life. That was uh, the moment. Should we watch it again? It was so cute. Let's watch it again. I generate soil that gives life. I generate soil that gives life. Okay, and uh, now that's fantastic fungi, and that's a rich image because it was extremely detailed, not a poor image like the one Maya Dern just, when we looked at just by Maya Dern, but it is also very poetic, and it's also very documentary. Is it a video, is it uh, of, uh, does it qualify as video art? I don't know, what do you think? Does it qualify as art for you? Yeah, some yes, right? Definitely, because why? Because of the, what was the affect for you? How did it make you feel? You're really happy, like the cat video. <laughs> yeah, and that's a very valid thing for a video to do. We deserve movies that make us happy, and even if they're very brief, they're like little, little rewards in life, and then they can motivate us to go on. <clears throat> but formally, it's not video art. And we feel like it is, but it isn't. It's actually a documentary. It's an hour and a half long. It tells the story of uh, how mushrooms grow. <clears throat> it's a beautiful clip. Uh, it could be video art, cinema, music video, a documentary, or does it matter? The makers say it's a documentary, but out of context, just on its own, it could be video art, like we said. We could be inspired by the video to make art out of mushrooms, like Phil Ross, a um, uh, Bay Area artist, or make leather out of mushroom, mushrooms, like Sophia Wong and her Microworks venture. So saying this is, and this is this and that is that is too soon. It could shut down productive developments in thinking and feeling. A documentary can turn into art, and art can turn into a business, business that can help change the world. Real artists shape, like Steve Jobs said. Um, so uh, that is the case with Sophia Wong, who started playing with mushrooms as a kind of a, an uh, artistic form of expression, but then turned it into a leather production, and now has a whole company that produces vegan leather based on mushroom growth. The clip we just watched, watched was intended as a documentary by its makers, but depending on how and why we see it, we can be something very different. Bill Viola, a video artist based in Los Angeles, made videos that formally look very much like that mushroom clip because a lot of it is slow motion, but he intends them to be looked at like art in a gallery. And uh, so I don't know if we have a, uh, we had a, a clip of Bill Viola coming later. His reasons for doing so have to do with cultivating perception. He has an agenda, he wants to change the way you see the world. To this end, he leveraged an ever-expanding range of video media. He started out with the humble Porta Pack, which he got access to as an artist in residence at WNET Channel 13 in New York. Later in 1981, he got access to more sophisticated tools as an instructor at Cal State University Long Beach and as an artist in residence at Sony in Japan. Today, he works with huge special effects, stages, and very advanced high-speed cameras, so definitely um, rich image type work. You could say that he was always a media innovator, pushing the limits of what uh, the roots, the tools could do at the time, not in the service of technology, but rather in the service of human perception and human compassion. Of course, many movie directors use the same tools and techniques and are equally concerned with media innovation. A classic example is 2001 A Space Odyssey. For that movie directed by Stanley Kubrick in 1968, the special effects team led by Douglas Trumbull built a special so-called slit scan camera to create the Stargate sequence of which we have a still image up here right now. 
It allowed Douglas to make very controlled motion blur images, and the spatial effect resulted from the camera moving towards the slit of light uh, for each frame on a rail. So it's an extremely complicated device to make this effect, because there was no computers in 1968 to render this kind of thing here. So. Um, there's a, uh, maybe another slide here, no. Um, so th if you've seen the movie, uh, this is about a four minute long sequence in which uh, one of the members of, the, uh, so of a spaceship that uh, goes on an expedition uh, gets transported into a different plane of astral uh, consciousness and uh, maybe gets transported through the universe, maybe even to the origin of uh, the universe itself. Who knows, it's a very myth mysterious and mystical sequence, but it's just a whole bunch of lights that flash and that, tr that we travel through um, at a very high speed. And every now and then, just for anchoring, uh, because it is part of a narrative, we see the face of the actor uh, and the, the lights reflecting in his helmet and uh, he's being shook about and uh, as he's going through the maybe traveling at light speed, maybe going through space and time at the same time. However, this, uh, this is definitely cinema, it's definitely a rich image, it's definitely not video art, but it operates like video art within a narrative, and we'll look at that concept a little bit more later. Um, this high art image uh, produces a uh, low art version, which is probably the lowest form of digital culture you can get to, which is the lowly screensaver. Does anybody remember this one from your childhood days, McFlurry or Flurry? Um, so it, the sequence does look a bit today like the Macintosh Flurry screensaver, but it was the first thing out of its kind at the time, the Stargate sequence, and it was done without a computer on 70 millimeter film. Of course, nobody would talk about all this if it were not a crucial part of one of the most enduring science fiction films of all time. But is it video art? The intention of the filmmakers here was to tell a story, a story about humanity, humanity discovering the secret of life. The sequence serves to tell that story. And uh, the screensaver is an example of a rich image turning into a poor image, something generic, ubiquitous, and not at all epic. Although, <clears throat> I will have to add that one time I had a digital art installation in a museum, and uh, there was an opening, and one person came up to me very excited and said, oh, I saw this wonderful piece, it's really great. I think I saw the face of God in your artwork. It was all these colors swirling out of the middle, and I said, wait a minute, that sounds like the screensaver came on, and my project actually got shut down. And it was very embarrassing, so I had to climb back into the back of the projection system and, and uh, computer system and restart the computer and get my project back up. So <laughs> I was very honored to, to, to get that interpretation of my artwork, although it wasn't actually my artwork, I have to admit. So Hita Seil writes about the poor image. The poor image embodies the afterlife of many former masterpieces, just like we saw. So the screensaver is the afterlife of the Stargate sequence. Uh, <clears throat> many former masterpieces of cinema and video art. It has been expelled from the sheltered paradise that cinema seems to have once been. After being kicked out of the protected and often protectionist area of national culture, discarded from commercial circulation, these works have become travelers in a digital no man's land, constantly shifting their resolution and format, speed and media, sometimes even losing names and credits along the way. Now many of these works are back, as poor images, I admit. One could of course argue that this is not the real thing, but then, please anybody, show me this real thing. The poor image is no longer about the real thing, the originary original. Instead, it is about its own real conditions of existence, about swarm circulation, digital dispersion, fractured, fractured and flexible temporalities. It is about defiance and appropriation, just as it is about conformism and exploitation. In short, it is about reality." End quote from Nahita Cyril. Beautiful text. I would like to redeem the screensaver in another way. It could be a poem, too. The screensaver does not tell a story, rather it has a poetic quality. One difference between narrative and poetry, the other axis in our diagram, is that the narrative is propelled by a sequence of events in time, whereas poetry seeks to suspend the uh, passage of time and explore the many layers of meaning in a given moment. Of course, video hinges on the passage of time. If there is no change, we're looking at a photograph, not a movie. But there are ways to undo narrative expectations of time, to defamiliarize time, to make time strange. They include slow motion, panning over an unchanging scene to show different aspects at the same time, which is hopefully what we're going to do with Saatchi working on this project right now, showing the same movement from different angles, a looping clip repeating the same moment indefinitely. But what? But why does video art get so concerned with defamiliarizing time? 
one of the most obvious normative functions of our time is productivity. <coughs> Many mainstream video media support productivity because so much happens in any given movie in so little time. No matter what the story is, it's told very fast. The pace is often frenetic. Video art responds to this normative time critically by defamiliarizing time. Video art often accelerates beyond what feels safe uh, or lingers beyond what feels safe. In that way, video art often presents time in suspension poetically rather than narratively. Like I mentioned earlier, Professor Jackson alluded to this by a topic by introducing us to the discussion about the classical sculpture Laocon and his sons, which exhibits what Donna Haraway would call a thick moment, a moment that erode, that ended up lasting 2,000 years, and we're still looking at that sculpture. This thick moment is opposed to a narrative, fast or slow. Nothing happens in the thick moment. Time seems to stand still. Effectively, most of us, I bet, have experienced this feeling in times of great sorrow or in times of great joy. Video art mediates such things, great sorrow, great joy. Cinema, as we have seen with, <coughs> um, as we're about to see with Stalker, can insert scenes of suspended time within a narrative, but generally wants to do move, o move on after that. <coughs> so let's see if Stalker is coming up here. I'm gonna show a scene from a movie by Andrei Tarkovsky called Stalker, and um, it is a, a case of a contemplative sequence within a narrative story. Um, uh, the stalker here is not somebody um, staring at somebody inappropriately. It's a, a person exploring a place where a UFO might have landed. It's a very mysterious landscape. A stalker is actually a guide that goes into this forbidden territory to find out um, what kinds of alien technologies might be there. So it's really a science fiction movie based on a wonderful science fiction story. But the sequence here is really rich and it has um, well, let's just look, take a look at it. И цари земные, и вельможи, и богатые, и тысяченачальники, и сильные, и всякие свободные скрылись в пещеры и в ущелье гор, и говорят горам и камням, падите на нас. И скройте нас от лица сидящего на престоле и от гнева Агнца, ибо пришел великий день гнева его, и кто сможет Was it a beautiful visual poem? It goes like a poem, except in a poem we usually read from top to bottom, but here the camera went from bottom to top, 
and it has all these references. You see, what did you see in the water? Yeah, uh, anything in particular? Yeah? Coins, paintings, good. What else? Syringes, guns, there was a gun, and there's sort of a very poetic slow motion, but then suddenly it ends on this hand, which is maybe the hand of a dead person, maybe the hand of somebody who fell asleep, maybe the hand of, of, of somebody whose time has been frozen. We don't know, it's, he just fell asleep there, but still, in the poem we don't know. Um, but it's so beautiful because it changes the meaning of everything we saw before, much, much like in a poem, often the last line of the poem sort of changes the, and deepens the meaning of everything we've seen before. And in fact, um, so this operates like video art inside of a, a cinema. So let's see if we can go to the next slide here. So indeed, Mystical Pond inside of uh, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker um, is a rich image and is deeply poetic, and of course it's fiction. In it, there are several elements. Did you see this one? This is a paint, an etching by Rembrandt that was uh, thrown in the pond there. And uh, you saw it upside down, you saw the trees. Um, and of course, there's also um, an image of this. Uh, you saw this, this fellow here. Uh, which is from the um, Jan van Eyck's altarpiece from 1432. So uh, the art, art historical references here are supposed to um, reference uh, time travel, but also contemplation, but also a sort of um, a religious depth. And uh, so these are wonderful references to dive into. And you can see how, how artists look at each other's work and build it into each other's projects uh, very, very thoroughly, and it's good to catch these references. The scene itself could be video art, but since it is a narrative movie, it more precisely produces a timeless moment of contemplative immersion in an otherwise narratively progressive structure, a video art insert in a movie sequence. The contemplative immersion prompts many viewers to ask, what does it mean? But that is exactly what you are supposed to be asking, and you, as the viewer, should be able to figure out what it means to you uh, specifically. In the rest of the movie, each scene has a narrative purpose, and while the movie as a whole produces many mysteries, the narrative meaning of each scene is fairly clear, except, of course, for this mystical pool scene. Without the movie to surround it, the pool scene might well qualify as video art, as demonstrated by the nearly contemp contemporaneous reflecting pool by Bill, by Bill Viola from 1977. There is a longer version, but for our current conversation about time and video, uh, the brief this brief excerpt will work as well. So this is uh, Bill Viola, 1997, uh, The Reflecting Pool. Let's see if we can play it here. So this goes on for another minute or so, and then other things happen. But basically, you experience the moment of uh, build-up because you wonder what happens. Why is this guy standing there so long? And then he jumps suddenly, and it's kind of inhaling, goes up, 
and then he holds his position and he simply freezes. So <clears throat> the remarkable feature is here that the top half of the video is frozen while the bottom half and the soundtrack continue. Not resolving the mystery for us, Viola reminds us of the many mysteries we simply have to live with. <clears throat> Instead of succumbing to the temptation of explaining them prematurely. Like many of Bill Viola's work, this one deals with the afterlife and the parallel existence of the practical life and the intangible aspects of existence that loom below the surface of every moment. <clears throat> I think the man jumping out up but never hitting the pool simply died, and life around him goes on. It's both epic and trivial, it's elemental. The video has an autobiographical uh, reference. When Viola was a child, he almost drowned in a lake on a family vacation. The experience of what he felt and saw in that brief time while he was underwater before his uncle saved him left a mark on his life and work. The grainy video is an artifact of the medium. Bill Viola was working at the time with early video tools and devices like the Quantel video effects machine as a student at Syracuse University, a student just like you. Here is a brochure describing the ultimate <coughs> video editing machine of this time, courtesy of the Internet Archive. That's not this one, we saw this one already. Onwards, there we go. Here's the Quantel DP5000, which may have well been the machine that uh, Viola used to make this video. Um, I'm not sure exactly which one it was, but one of those. It's remarkable that the machine, for all its marketing hyperbole, did not last, but Bill Viola's use of the freeze frame did. The work is in many collections around the world, including at the Guggenheim in Bilbao. Later versions of the Quantel video tools included the Quantel paint box, which was first allowed for digital animation, as seen in the Dire Straits music video Money for, no for Nothing, released in June 28, 1985. While the song and the video have ample pop appeal, they don't speak to engage the kind of, they don't seek to engage the kind of contemplation that video art has to offer. But other artists using the same tools, such as Jennifer Bartlett, <coughs> We're going to watch a clip of this uh, um, Dire Straits uh, video, uh, which was made with the Quantel paint box, and then we're going to look at some digi digital art made with it by actual artists. <laughs> enough of that but you can see that all this was animated digitally and at the time was absolutely revolutionary of course by now we're used to far more sophisticated uh, animations and computer graphics but um, I want to point out that uh, on the left here we have David Hockney on the right we have Jennifer Bartlett two uh, famous British artists uh, working with the Quantel paint box and trying to make digital art for the first time in 1985 although there's a, a similar work done by uh, Andy Warhol uh, um, a little earlier but um, this is a uh, for, for video for television television in 1985 and uh, so you can see how um, let's see here uh, <coughs> there's uh, David Hockney's and uh, uh, Jennifer Bartlett's our, our styles are very distinct Hockney is more about uh, creating complex scenes and uh, uh, with uh, maybe a, an emphasis on uh, a, a kind of a very colorful lush flower flowery life and then Jennifer Bartlett's more about systems of re reproduction representation and uh, oftentimes features many grids and uh, their styles uh, remain intact even though they're using a new medium a precursor of the now omnipresent tablet drawing tools such as procreate which many of you i'm sure are using and although they have they are made with video tools and although they have a strong poetic quality they're not really video art they're art made with video tools you see how tricky it is to classify art the purpose of this talk is not to confuse you, but rather to embrace it, the notion that a classification can be a good place to start asking questions about art, rather than shutting down the potential range of meaning and resonances for, um, uh, for, that art can have. Rather than hard edges, we can draw rich connections between, say, Money for Nothing and David Hockney's quote that he uh, issued, that he, that he shared while he was painting this drawing, that says, some people might think this Quantel paint box is much too bright but we only think that because of what we only think that because of what other pictures have done to us. 
always distancing us and always therefore making color less important. So we see David Hawking's aesthetic manifest here. He wants to bring us close to the scenes by bringing uh, very bright colors into the picture. And so art can bring us closer. In her essay, Breaking Down the Trichotomy Between Video Art, Artists, Films, and Cinema, Veronica Williamson writes, cinema is seen as something that most, that is more story and actor focused and is expected to reach a wider audience for commercial profit. Artist films favor aesthetic or artistic vision or experimental methods over commercial profit, and video art is concerned solely with discovering and manipulating the medium of moving images themselves. So questions about the apparatus of cinema, questions about representation, questions about time. These are three separate definitions that dictate the manner in which artists see themselves, how in which critics and audiences view works, and in what way the work is or is not commodifi commodified after its creation. By willingly adhering to this trichotomy, the intellectual community, in other words us, uh, upholds a limiting and elitist status quo of the modern art world, making it clear that these definitions are superficially constructed. This construction, instead of legitimizing film as a medium, inhibits a level of creativity and authenticity that could liberate not only all film and video makers as a whole, but also provide audiences with more complex, fulfilling experiences without narrowing the range of current distribution models. Right on. Instead, when we allow both works of art and our perceptions, therefore, to resonate with mo modes of narrative contemplation and entertainment, shock and seduction, rather than to be locked into these concepts, we're more likely to understand how art is being made by transgression of established categories and by subverting expectations, by using media in new ways, and by challenging modes of established viewership. Bill Viola worked for Namjoon Pike as a student. It is perhaps there that he learned how to explicitly subvert power modes of interaction with established media sorry, proper modes of interaction with established media. Namjoon Pike, instead of dutifully tuning a cathode ray tube to a major broadcast channel for the evening news, tuned it to a powerful magnet, as you can see here, uh, um, creating a moment of contemplation and suspending time. Here we have video art, but it is cameraless, and it's also a sculpture. <clears throat> then next we have another piece uh, by, uh, by uh, by Namjoon Pike. In another work, Namjoon Pike presented pieces of audio magnetic tape from a reel onto a wall like a drawing, and he invited participants to glide an audio, uh, uh, an audio magnetic reading head over the pieces of tape to hear what is recorded there. And of course, when we move the head over the tape, our speed of reading is not correct, so we do something like a DJ scratching, and uh, we hear a distorted version of time and sound. These lines, in turn, rem might remind you of Jennifer Bartlett's or David Hawking's drawings. Perhaps there is one constant in video art that uh, the, to use media with a certain irreverence, a revolutionary streak. Most media have the function of bringing members of a community into alignment. Um, and this is very important. I'm going to show an image here uh, of a, a poster, actually a sign, that definitely brings people into alignment. Um, um, uh, this is a sign in a park that may say what is, an, a sign in a park, for example, may say what is and what is not allowed. This sign after 1933, was produced after 1933, uh, in Germany says that Jews are not welcome in our town. Juden sind in unserem Ort nicht erwünscht. And uh, this is an extreme example of normative media, of media telling you what to do, even if the norm is insane. In 1933, the German people were uh, uh, engaged in a fascist movement which led to the extermination of six million Jews. In that time, my own family, which included my Jewish grandmother and my Prussian grandfather, ex experienced extreme turmoil. My father grew up in those days and was not told that his mother was Jewish until he was 17 years old. All references to Judaism were erased. Recently, I was working on a project called The Night Vision, uh, which had to do with uh, the prophecy of Zacharias, and I asked him if he still had the old menorah that his mother gave him that was in her house. He said, what is a menorah? I reminded him that I was referring to a uh, uh, seven-armed lampstand that was in our house when I grew up. And he said, oh, that old thing? No, I gave that to a museum a while ago. I don't remember which one. So it's gone, it's lost. Erasure is real and permanent, but in the context of that erasure, I was able to reimagine that menorah. In my version, in my version, um, 
it is constantly falling apart, the menorah, and is remaking itself, just like the titular night vision by Zacharias. It takes both worldly and spiritual power to maintain something special, something central to our lives, and something that keeps us going when the going gets tough. This work is deeply connected to GIF animations from the mid-90s and is generated digitally with code instead of a camera. So here we have another example of video art that is not made with a camera at all, but instead by, with images that are generated by re literally ingesting old images and then, uh, and then um, um, uh, producing a new image. And I think I can show this here quickly. Let's see if that will work. It's always interesting to run live code. There we go. So this is a work that has no temporal duration. It, uh, it, it goes on and on and recreates itself in ways that I can't really anticipate. But I did write some rules to make it do certain things. So for example, the menorah here with its seven lights is uh, trying to reinscribe itself over the distracting gifts that come through. But also there's two trees here symbolized by these lines that bring olive oil to the menorah to keep the light going. So the menorah is a uh, first described in Genesis and uh, is a central element of uh, Jewish culture and uh, uh, tradition and religion. So I really appreciate the, the erasing effect that is going on here. And then also the reimagining. So um, actually this piece is at the uh, Magnus Institute, which is an institution right across from here um, on uh, Alston Street. So let's see if we can uh, switch this back. So this is video art without a camera at all. And it's a rich image in the sense that it has high resolution, but it's made up of lots of poor images, those early GIF animations. So let's go back here and uh, continue full screening this. Let's see, can we do that? And uh, this brings me to the next project I'd like to talk about. So to challenge the normative functions of media in times where cultural progress is desired, many artists choose to subvert the medium itself. Inventing a new word, such as a new pronoun, is initially a subversion of established media, such as language, but eventually becomes an instance of cultural progress. The last example I want to share today is by US artist Sandra Perry, and it's an installation Typhoon Coming On. The work is a set of concentric structures in a museum. The outside layer is a wall projection with wave and water videos, some of which are not unrelated to the pool clip by Stalker, uh, from Stalker. The space, so, so, and there are also uh, projections on the wall that really dematerialize or defamiliarize the wall and make the wall feel fluid and maybe not as reliable as it used to be. Uh, um, the space inside those walls is filled with a domestic space, including a sofa on uh, cinder blocks, a TV, and a video wallpaper. But the domestic space is not safe. It is a site of invasions, threats, and police violence. The text here subverts the imagined safety of the home. And you can see that uh, um, there's, a, there's a, a, a report here about gun violence inside the home. And uh, here's a brief clip of this expansive and immersive uh, installation. <laughs>
So I'm going to uh, uh, say a few more things about this piece. I also want to acknowledge that uh, Tyra Nichols is uh, um, an African-American male, about 29 year, nine years old, who was uh, recently uh, beaten to death by police officers in, in Memphis. And uh, we're about to uh, see that video footage being released. And I uh, just want to acknowledge that the kinds of themes that Sandra Perry is addressing here are very present in our society and very present in our lives every day. Um, so while we can make images of things, and images often bring things into a space that we can control, um, it is also true that um, uh, we clamor for images to deliver justice and to create transparency. And uh, there's uh, so many more things that remain to be done. So this uh, space that Sondra Perry creates is a space where the closer we get to the interior of a home, the less safe it feels. And uh, Tyre Nichols was 100 feet away from his home when he was killed. So um, the, uh, the space also has uh, allusions to um, a kind of a uh, high-end contemporary condominium building, apparently, with the video designs on the outside that invite us in, a living space on the inside, and at the very core, a server room in the middle that keeps the whole thing going. And it's also a critique of a society in which we're constantly urged to be more and more productive. While the work uh, references video game aesthetics extensively, it is itself not a game. It is about labor, black labor specifically, and black safety and black security, which has, and uh, uh, black labor which has been historically exploited and violently undercompensated in this country since, 19, since 1619. It is the nightmare of slavery, of labor without compensation, and it puts us as participants in a position to ask how we can get past this foundation of exploitation in its historic form and past the continuation of this exploitation in its present contemporary form, where many of us are made, feel, made to feel that we are not good enough, not productive enough, not normal enough, and at the same time, paradoxically, not amazing enough. It's up to us to find answers uh, to that, those questions on our own. The work sh throws the questions at us, but doesn't give us the answers. So in this lecture, we made connections between video art and cinema, video art and public access television, video art and music videos, and video art and video games. We questioned the need to keep these categories separate. In fact, we focused on connecting differently classified instances of the moving image rather than separating them. We emphasize the subversive power of using media against the grain, media against the grain, in the quest for cultural progress. We also showed how many works of art, perhaps specifically video art, act to provoke us to think of ways to solve common problems in our own way. For only when changes in individual consciousness connect with broader societal changes can we find our way to collective progress. And by God, do we need that. Thank you very much. So. So with that, um, you're in the center of this space of rich image, poor image, poetic narrative, documentary, and fiction. And the question is not only what you see in a movie, but what you see in your life, and where do you position yourself as an observer relative, what's hap relative to what's happening to you, and what kinds of images about yourself do you put out in the world, and how do you replicate power structures by doing so? And uh, not to be too theoretical, we're now going to go to a uh, example of this that we just created. And uh, Satya, are you ready? Is this going to work? Yes, it would be possible. OK, let's not have expert issues. Let's do that. And uh, after the demo, we'll maybe take some questions, and then we're all, all set for today. Thank you for doing it, and thanks for figuring out solutions on the fly. Yeah. How does it look? Hmm. <laughs> I think I think we'll have to accept a level of uh, crunchy granola here, but it's beautiful. Good. It's beautiful. We're gonna do a manual loop here. And. All right. Am I projecting? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. Thanks for your support. How's it coming? And are we mirroring? See, so it gets stuck. We should be good. That's good. Looks great. There we go. Yeah. It's getting into its paces. We got this. <laughs> um, I don't understand why my computer is struggling. You have too much open. 
Possibly. That would not surprise me. Oh, great. Okay, so let's take a look at this. I want to see this too. I'm going to go forget to see. <laughs> All right, so we're in Premiere here, and uh, uh, one thing we see is that normally when we do these kinds of things, we don't see the cameras, right? That's part of the cinematic effect. You have to make the camera disappear. But here we socialize the cinematic effect and in a way democratize it. And uh, OK, enough said. Let's roll it. It may be a bit clunky as it gets into its paces. And there we go. Nice. You're getting the spin? Yeah. yeah all right. We well done. <laughs> and boy, are we dodging bullets. It's great. I'll upload a much cleaner version to the drive in all the next right. few minutes. Good. What well, was that? Um, thanks for coming. Take care. Goodbye.